Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of this show. I am Van Bob Van Buren, your host. Uh, hope you've all had a great evening so far. Uh, welcome. Uh, for some, we have a lot of newcomers here, new subscribers. So uh, just kind of give you a little rundown what the show's about. Each week, I have an individual guest that comes on, talks about a hobby, a profession, special interest. Uh, might have some music coming up. So uh, it's pretty much anything, you know, Hence the word variety. So uh, that's what I'll do each week. Is just you know you never know what you're gonna you have. It's always going to be an interesting guest, and uh, so I think you're really going to enjoy it. I also want to take the time to uh, open it up. Uh, always looking for a person with you know an interesting profession, a hobby, uh, talent. Uh, maybe they've written a book. Uh, maybe they can do arts and crafts, or maybe they're in kind of in some kind of adventurous hobby, would love to talk to them. So if you are like that, or if you know someone like that, uh, please contact me. There is my email address on the screen right there. It's vbvarieties at gmail.com. That's V as in Van, V as in Buren, varieties at gmail.com. So if you know someone, uh, promote their business, uh, what they like to do, what they want to talk about or entertain, please just uh, send, uh, I'll point to the right direction, <laughs> email that right there. And uh, I will see how we can schedule them on. Would love to have you love have them there tonight. Uh, we have a very, very uh, interesting and serious topic as well, but I want to sort of put you, the person watching this in this situation. Okay. Just imagine this, if you will, it's world war two. It's the early forties. Most of Western Europe, if not all of Western Europe, has been occupied by Adolf Hitler's enemies. You're flying a mission over occupied Europe, an American. And your plane gets shot down. You are now in occupied territory. Just consider that for a minute. What would you do? Now, remember, you're in a country that maybe used to be friendly but is now occupied by enemy territory or enemy uh, soldiers, such as these here. Okay. You land, but who do you trust? The natives are there, but how do you know the natives are really on your side or will really help you? To give put this in context, I have downloaded a map of Europe during World War II. So let me bring that map up. That way you'll know exactly where we're talking about here at this time. Again, this is Europe as it looked in World War II. If you look there, you see Germany. But if you look to your left of Germany, or you would say west of Germany, you'll see the country of Belgium. They've kind of initialized it, B-E-L-G. Uh, Belgium was occupied at that point by Adolf Hitler's army. Uh, so was France, so was Luxembourg, and so was the Netherlands. All those countries right there were under enemy occupation. There's a picture now being shot down over one of those countries. Who do you trust? You're in enemy territory, maybe alone. Your crew is also shot down. What, if anything, could you think of to do to survive? Your family back home has no idea whether you're alive or dead. That would be a very, very stressful situation. I think you would all agree. Well, that actually happened. This is based on a true story of a gentleman that was in World War II and was shot down over enemy territory. And his son has written a book called Shot Down. And he will talk about that tonight and give us more insight to his, I mean, hero, such a weak word to describe his father. Uh, his father was an amazing man from what I've read and what I've heard. So uh, he can tell you more than I can. So let me bring my guest on now. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to Steve Snyder. He's written a book about his father, uh, his uh, his very stressful time in Europe when he was shot down. So, Mr. Snyder, welcome to the Van Buren Variety Show. Well, thanks, Bob. I'm glad to be on. So let's just kind of take it from here. Uh, tell us how your father, his military service, and how he kind of came to be where he was. Okay. Well, as a result of the first peacetime draft in history implemented by President Roosevelt in the fall of 1940, uh, my dad uh, went into the service in April of 1941. Mm -hmm. And he went into the, uh, the Army, uh, the infantry, and he was stationed at Fort Lewis, Washington. 
a couple, three months later, uh, he married uh, my mother, uh, Ruth Hempel. Uh, and then that December, uh, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor and the United States was at war. Well, my mom was really scared at the time. The, the future was very uncertain. So she went up to visit my dad in Washington over Christmas and uh, she got pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> so my dad uh, is a little concerned how he's going to su support his new family as a new bride, a baby on the way. And he didn't think he could do that very well on a private's pay in the army. So he decided to volunteer for the Air Force where he could make more money, especially if he could make it through pilot training and become an mm -hmm. officer. So in June of 1942, uh, he entered the, uh, the Army Air Corps. I went through pre-flight training at Santa Ana, California, and then went through the various stages of pilot training where he uh, finally graduated from advanced pilot training in April of 1943, where he received his commission as a second lieutenant mm -hmm. at his pilot wings. Uh, and then from there, he went to transitional uh, training where he learned how to fly a four engine B-17 bomber, then went to operational crew training down in Texas where the various members of the crew came together and they learned to operate as a team. And when they were deemed ready, they were assigned overseas to the European Theater of Operations. And on October 21st of 1943, my dad and his crew reported to the 306 bomb group uh, based at Thurlie, England, which is about 60 miles north of London. And from there, they started flying uh, bombing missions over uh, occupied Europe and Germany. Wow, very, that, very interesting. You mentioned this crew. Is this the crew right here in this picture? Yeah, B-17 had uh, a 10-man crew, the four, off four officers who were kneeling in front uh, my dad is the lower left. Uh, he was the first pilot and as such the commander of the plane and the crew. And then going across, you have the co-pilot, the navigator and the bombardier. And then standing behind the four officers or six enlisted men or non-commissioned mm -hmm. officers who were mainly gunners. Uh, five of those men came home, but five of them did not. Oh, wow. That's not the Susan Ruth uh, they're standing in. That's just a... Uh, a B-17 that they took their crew, crew picture in front of when they arrived in England. Okay. And let's get a, here's another good picture of your dad I'd like to share with the audience. Um, and was that right? Is, was that still, he was still in England here? Oh, uh, well that, that actually is after he came back home. He came and, home. Okay. Yeah. Right. And uh, he was, he was promoted to a captain at that time. So afterwards, trials of missing in action and uh, everything that he went through after being shot down. And uh, this was when he came back home and had that picture. Things were a little happier. <laughs> I can tell you, he's smiling really big, so yeah. he has a right to. <laughs> but that's a handsome guy. Um, so kind of go, kind of take us into uh, kind of that, that day uh, mm -hmm. when he was doing a mission over, I guess, occupied Belgium and uh, kind of, Kind of, kind of what some kind of what happened there. Okay, uh, was on February eighth of nineteen forty four. Uh, missioned uh, Frankfurt, Germany. Uh, when my dad's plane, they dropped their bombs successfully, but the bomb bay doors got hit by flak and a aircraft fire, and they couldn't get them back up. And as a, as a result, they started losing it caused the drag in the plane. They started losing airspeed, and they fell behind the bomber formation heading back to England to their bases. And uh, they were singled out by two German Focke Wolf fighters, uh, 190s. And like wolves or lions uh, on prey, they swooped in. And in the ensuing air battle, the Susan Ruth was shot down. Uh, two of the 10 crew members were killed in the plane. The other eight were able to bail out successfully. Um, but both those German fighters were shot down too. One was piloted by Siegfried Merrick. Uh, his plane crashed and he died in the plane. And the other was piloted by Hans Berger, who was able to bail out, uh, and he survived the war. And my dad, after he bailed out, uh, he came down uh, right at the French-Belgian border. Uh, and he came down into some trees, and his parachute got hum hung up on the branches, and he was dangling 20 feet off the ground and couldn't get down. But fortunately for him, a couple of uh, young Belgian men, Henri Franken and Raymond Dervan, uh, came to his rescue before the Germans got to him. Uh, this occurred early in the afternoon, and after they helped him down out of the trees, uh, they told him to stay put and hide because they thought it was too dangerous to try to move him in daylight with German patrols combing the area. 
So that night they came back and got him and they took him to the Dravan farmhouse. Uh, he only stayed there one night because they thought, again, it was too dangerous for him to stay there any longer than that with those German patrols in the area. So the next night, uh, a Belgium customs officer, Paul Tilcan, came on a tandem bicycle, uh, brought uh, one of his spare custom officer's uniforms that my dad put on. And then they headed out uh, to go to a safer location. And uh, I'll tell you one little story about uh, that, that trip. Uh, Please, my dad, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> my, my dad had some uh, shrapnel wounds uh, in his left leg. Oh, so he could only pedal with his, with his right leg, his good leg. And uh, they came to a hill and they weren't able to pedal up it anymore because it was too steep. So they got off the bike and started pushing it up the hill. And when they got up to the top of the hill, there was a, a cafe there, a cabaret. And the lights were on, loud music was playing, people were talking loudly, laughing, and all of a sudden, two German officers come walking out with these two young girls. And one of them comes up to my dad, puts his arm around him, and asks for a light for his cigarettes. Oh, man. Well, my dad's, you know, he's flabbergasted, you know, probably pretty well, I'd be scared to death, yeah. Because, <laughs> you know, he couldn't speak German or he couldn't speak French at that time. Uh, but fortunately, Paul, you know, knew what they wanted and he took out a match and uh, lit the guy's cigarette. My dad said these guys, you know, were drunk and, and talkative and wanted to, to, to talk. Uh, but uh, uh, Paul said they needed to go on their way. Yeah. So they, <laughs> they went on their way. Uh, my dad said they were uh, the two German officers were too drunk or schnockered, as he put it, and too interested <laughs> in these young girls to pay much attention to a couple, you know, customs officers mm -hmm. pushing a bike up uh, at the, in the middle of the night. Wow. Well, that yeah. was, whew, that's pretty stressful. <laughs> yeah. And that, that building uh, is still there. Uh, all this uh, occurred, uh, like I said, right at the French-Belgian border in southern uh, Belgium is all rural farmland. So nothing's really changed. All these uh, locations where the events took place uh, in the book are, are all still there. So you can go there and visit where history was made. That that would be interesting. I say I love history. I love seeing old sites and old buildings, and and I think those need to be preserved for the future generation, so that you know that they'll remember. Um, here's an interesting tidbit. Uh, you mentioned now. I know, but my audience doesn't know. The B-17 that your dad was flying was called the Susan Ruth. And so if people aren't familiar, you want to know, well, why was it called the Susan Ruth? So you tell us, why was the B-17 named Susan Ruth? Okay, well, that uh, baby that they, that they had uh, after their uh, rendezvous in uh, Washington was, was Susan Ruth Snyder. So he, uh, she was one year old at the time he went overseas. So uh, they named the plane after uh, my oldest sister. His own daughter uh, was named. That was named. <laughs> of the ten-man crew, uh, only three of them, of the the crew, were married, uh, mm -hmm. and my dad was the only crew member that, that had a had a child at that time. I thought that was interesting. He named it after his 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 daughter. Right. Very interesting. <laughs> Um, okay, I've got, like I said, we got a live, uh, audience watching. We just, we got one little question here. Let's see uh, if you can answer this one. Uh, Randy says, where is Steve from? <laughs> okay. Um, well, like my mother, uh, I was born in Pasadena, California, and, uh, okay. we both went to UCLA. Actually, my mother was a classmate of, uh, the legendary Jackie Robinson. When I was at UCLA, I was a classmate of, uh, Lou Alcindor, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Oh, wow. Uh, but now I live in uh, Seal Beach, California, with a little quiet beach town uh, in Orange County, south of L.A., about uh, 40 miles. Okay. I mean, is it is it really sunny California? I've never been to California, but I keep hearing about sunny California. Is it for the most part? <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it, it's, it's a funny point. When I was growing up, they always talked about the weather, and I could never understand what they were – meant about the weather because it's always the same here you know and uh but in 1985 i started traveling all around the united states on my job mm -hmm. and i learned real quick what they meant about the weather you know going back east and, and, <laughs> and the snow and, and freezing and then you know during the summer the heat and the humidity 
So uh, I finally found out when I got older what they meant ab about the weather because it's uh, <laughs> it's so mild here. Oh, well, let's talk about uh, an interesting book, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you, if you are a history buff like me, you will want to buy this book. Um, I have not read it yet, but I've read the preface and it's just talking to Steve here. Interesting. So let me bring this up for the audience. Uh, the entire book is called Shot Down. Uh, it's the true story of pilot Harry Howard Snyder and the crew of the B-17 Susan Ruth. Now, I do want to correct something on this picture. Uh, at the very top, you'll see it says winner of 13 National Book Awards, but that's actually old information now. Uh, Steve, how many awards has it won now? I think it's pushing 30. <laughs> 30, 3-0. Oh, yes. wow. It's, uh, it's done pretty well. Well, it's an amazing story, and it's just not about my dad, but the book goes into detail about what happened to each member of my dad's crew and also about all the Belgian people that risked their lives trying to help them uh, escape uh, from the Germans and hide from the Germans. The first half of the book kind of builds up to the day that the plane was shot down. And then the second half of the book is all about what happens afterwards. And I think that's what uh, I'm intrigued by your book, Steve, because I mean, if it was just only about your dad, I would still, I would still be wanting to read it, but you've gotten different point of views. It's about different people that was there. Right, exactly. And, and something, happened oh, wait, each, you know, something happened, different happened to each guy. And like I said, five of the crew came home, but five of them did not. So there's mm -hmm. there's, uh, there's triumph and tragedy in the book. And I'd also, also like to point out to the audience, uh, not only did Steve write his stories of his dad and the crew members there, here's a very unique part of the book. He also has an interview with this man, in the book. So Steve, will you let us tell, tell us who this man is? Uh, that's uh, Luftwaffe pilot Hans Berger, who shot down my dad's plane. Mm -hmm. uh, all my dad knew and all the Air Force knew at the time was that my dad's plane was shot down by two German Focke-Wolf fighters. And that's all I thought I'd ever know. Uh, but one day when I was doing my research, my wife just casually said, well, why don't you try to find the German pilot that shot down your dad's plane? And I'm thinking to myself, oh, she's so naive. You know, she doesn't <laughs> know what she's talking about. It's a ridiculous idea. It'll be impossible. You know, more than likely, he, whoever shot him down was killed during the war. Sure. But 70 years later, you know, they're passed away by now. I can't speak German. Mm -hmm. Like a good yeah. husband, I, I did what my wife told me to do, and I found Hans Berger. And fortunately for me, he became a translator after the war and speaks perfect English. Wow. And, I, and when I found him, I found out that I discovered that the gunners on my dad's plane shot Hans down at the same time that he shot down my dad's plane. So they shot each Both other. Ways. <laughs> Here's the picture, ladies and gentlemen. Here's a picture of Steve with Hans Berger. Uh, with this this man who uh, it was in his 90s at the time. So, uh, I mean, and you got his perspective as well, Steve, in your book, correct? Yeah, he gave me some wonderful insight uh, that's in the book about what it was like up to, to go up against the 8th Air Force. Uh, Hans was shot down three times, but survived oh, wow. the war. Uh, he, he's, that's, he's wearing his, uh, his fighter jacket there. You probably can't see it, but he has his iron cross pinned to it. He shot okay. down seven B-17s and one Spitfire. And he said it was unfortunate they had to be shooting at each other, but but that that was war. That was war. Our countries were at war. Yeah. And, you know, and I think that's amazing, Steve, because that shows, you know, that you can shake hands with someone who was once, quote, the enemy. I mean, it shows, I think it shows forgiveness. I think it shows the, the human spirit that we can move on. And, uh, you know, again, everybody, I mean, your dad was serving the United States. And Hans was serving Germany. I mean, so again, it's war. And uh, but uh, to talk to him, in other words, you're getting another point of view in your book. I think that's to me, that's very that's intriguing. That's very, very, that's very nice. And, you know, and I'm seeing another picture that you took of him. He's holding your book right there. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. He's at, he's at that's his apartment in uh, Munich, Germany, where he lives. He still lives in Germany. Yeah. Oh, okay. 
and we've become good friends. You know, after all, he was pretty much just like the U.S. Airman. He was 19, 20 years old, you know, trying to do a job, fighting for his country and trying to stay alive. Mm -hmm. And at one point in time, my dad's path crossed Hans' path. And so Hans is part of my dad's life, part of his uh, story. And uh, so I, I felt kind of a, a kinship to, uh, to Hans. I didn't really have any hard feelings uh, uh, about it. Um, if my dad had been killed, maybe I'd feel differently. Uh, I don't. I don't know. But uh, we become mm -hmm. friends, and uh, that's awesome. Yeah, for the book, I just interviewed him over the telephone and through the email. But I've been okay. to Germany, been to Germany twice uh, since I wrote the book uh, to visit Hans and uh, uh, spend time with him. I think we have another question from the audience here. Uh, let's see if I can bring that up. Uh, this one comes from Gary. He's right. Only five made it out alive. Did the Germans catch the other three trying to get out? Well, five of them came home. Actually, eight of the 10 crewmen bailed out successfully. Okay. Uh, two of the crew were killed in the plane. And then of the uh, eight men that, that bailed out, uh, three were captured immediately and became prisoners of war. Mm -hmm. uh, two of them were so severely injured that they were repatriated back to the U.S. before the war ended. Okay. Uh, the third man, that uh, the flight engineer, Roy Holbert, uh, that was captured, he spent the remainder of the war as a POW involved in the Black March, the 86-day Black March. Uh, my dad and another uh, crewman evaded capture, uh, although they weren't uh, together at all and had totally different experiences uh, evading. And then uh, three other crewmen, uh, they they evaded capture for a, a couple months. Oh, uh, they actually joined up with five other downed airmen from uh, three other B-17s. And they were hiding in a makeshift hut in the, the woods outside of Chimay, Belgium. But a Belgium collaborator ratted them out to the Germans and the Germans uh, came and captured him, uh, took him into the Sumer schoolhouse, interrogated him, then brought him back out in the woods and shot all eight of them. Mm. Oh, man. Oh, that's horrible. Wow. Yeah. And I like to put that into context. Yeah, you told your story at the beginning, but for my audience here, anyone who watches this, you, he, you know, Steve said his father was shot on the Belgian-France border, but in order to put that into context, both France and Belgium were both occupied by Germany. So it was technically enemy territory on either side. Um, I'm wondering just how did your dad know? I mean, I guess you have to trust somebody because, you know, unfortunately with every occupied country, you get collaborators that are collaborate with the enemy. So um, I guess, I mean, I'm sure it was probably difficult to trust people right at first because you don't know which side they're on. Correct. Did he ever say anything about that? <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, yeah, they're, you know, they're, in these occupied countries, you have all sorts of uh, different types of people. But, you know, the, the first three years of the war, you know, Germany was winning the war. And mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of people in these occupied countries figured that, well, Germany's, you know, they're going to win. And mm -hmm. so we want to be on the side of the winners. That's, well, that's so true. Yeah. <laughs> with them. And then you have other people that are just selfish and out for themselves. And so, you know, they were just greedy people. And so they were collaborators because, you know, any when uh, Aaron was shot down, there was a they put the Germ the Nazis put a bounty on their head. So if you were a, a Frenchman or a, a Belgian and uh, you turned over and ratted out a, a down airman, you know, you, you get paid a, a bunch of money. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But it was really stressful for my dad, you know, first of all, you know, his plane's attacked by fighters, it's on fire, he has to bail out, he oh, comes yeah. to a foreign country, has no idea where he is, doesn't know what happened to his buddies on the crew, can't communicate with the U.S. military, and as you mentioned, he's being helped by total strangers, they can't really communicate, because he can't speak French at the beginning, and they can't speak English. He has a little French English dictionary in his escape kit that he could refer to. And any one of these people could be a collaborator and turn him over to the Germans. And while he was in hiding, uh, he was missing in action for seven months. 
Seven well, he, months. Oh, he was wow. in hiding. He had several close calls of being uh, discovered by the Gestapo that are described in the book, which were pretty, pretty harrowing. I'm sure. Wow. And speaking of stressful, uh, you had told me something before. Interesting note. Uh, you said, and you just said that your dad was missing for seven months there. So while he's missing for seven months, what's going on at the home front with his wife, your mom? What's happening there about this time? Well, uh, when my dad left, my mother was pregnant again. So while my dad was missing, missing in action, my other sister was born. Mm -hmm. uh, while so he my was dad missing. Didn't know whether he had a girl, a boy, a girl until he came back home. But that, you know, here's my mom back in Pasadena, California, with a one year old, you know, girl and an infant baby girl, not knowing if she'd ever see her husband. That's uh, mm -hmm. One thing that uh, makes the book real personal is that there's lots of excerpts from letters by members of the crew, uh, family, oh, really? mm -hmm. uh, that make it really uh, poignant, especially the letters that are ex uh, exchanged and excerpts from those letters after the crew was shot down and, 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 and the fear that wives and mothers and sweethearts uh, uh, felt and expressed to each other in letters uh, after they found out that their the crew was missing in action and didn't know if you know who was alive, who was who was going to make it. Uh, that, that was really uh, moving uh, excerpts from those letters. So when he was shot down, uh, was he in Belgium the whole time, or did he go to France, or just kind of take us from there? Uh, well, after Paul till till can. Uh, picked him up on the, the tandem bicycle bicycle. He, they were, he was there after that, he was moved from place to place to place in Belgium. Oh, wow. uh, how long he stayed at any given location depended on how brave the people were who lived there and how dangerous the Belgium underground thought it was for him to stay there. He might spend one night at one location or six weeks at another location on the move. Yeah. Mm -hmm. On the move. Uh, and uh, he went by car, bicycle, walking, railroad, all different forms of uh, transportation. But the people who hid my dad or any down there, for that matter, were unbelievably brave people. They risked their yeah. lives, not only Absolutely. their lives, but the lives of their family and friends because if the German secret police, the Gestapo, found out about it, they'd be arrested, yeah. uh, tortured, no and either sent to a concentration camp or shot. And some of the people that helped my dad and other members of the crew met that fate. Mm, that's sad. But now he did go to France and then he would join. Was this the French resistance, what I'm seeing here? Yeah. Finally, my dad got tired of hiding. Now, word came that the Allies had landed at Normandy on June 6, D-Day, and he decided to get back in the fight. Uh, unlike most airmen, my dad had that year's uh, experience and training in the infantry, so he knew how to fight on the ground. So he decided to join the French resistance, uh, much to the chagrin of his helpers, Belgium helpers, because they, you know, it was much too dangerous. You know, absolutely fighting, or uh, if he was captured by the Germans at that point, he'd be shot as a terrorist. Um, the the safest thing, or the smartest thing, maybe for him to do, was just to stay hunkered down and in hiding and wait for the U.S. armies to come up after D-Day and liberate the area. But he thought it was his duty to, uh, you know, get back in the fight that, you know, there were Americans out there fighting and dying, dying and he felt that felt it was his duty. So That's another great. another uh, one of his helpers, Amy Cools, uh, they got on bicycles and they rode across the border from Belgium into France. And my dad met up with a, a unit of the French resistance. They were called the, the Mackey. Mm -hmm. And they Which were those, called, I just showed that these people here. Okay. Yeah, that wasn't the group that my dad joined, but that gives you an idea of what they look like. Sure. There were uh, small, independent, ragtag guerrilla groups located all across France. And they harassed the Germans. They would disrupt uh, communications, sabotage railroad lines, assassinate German officers, attack German convoys. And they got their instructions uh, from the British through coded me messages over the BBC. Mm -hmm. My dad said if there was a... If the British said there'd be a convoy coming down this road at this time on this day, sure enough, they'd be there. And that was a result of the British cracking the German Enigma code and knowing that everything that the Germans were up to. And then they were also supplied by the Germans through uh, airdrops. 
And uh, again, in the book, there's several encounters described that uh, the resistance group uh, had with the Germans, which are pretty, wow. pretty exciting. It sounds interesting. I'm intrigued. <laughs> so my so, dad fought with uh, the, the French resistance for uh, a little over two months. And then finally, on uh, seven months after he bailed out on September 2nd of 1944, word came that there were U.S. troops in a nearby village of Trelon, France. So my dad went into town and the town square went up to an army major. Actually, it was an element of Patton's Third Army, which would come up through France after D-Day. Oh, wow. Mm. And he identified himself. Uh, they interrogated him to make sure he was who he said he was. And then he mm -hmm. caught a convoy taking German prisoners to Paris. And then in Paris, he hopped on a transport and made it back to uh, England, where he sent a Western Union telegram to my mom saying... Fit as a fiddle, honey. Bank the money because he had all that back pay. <laughs> oh, I bet she was so relieved. Oh, oh man, I can't, I, can't, I can't imagine what that day was like for my uh, my mother and uh, my dad's parents and you know other other relatives. Yeah, it was a glorious day for sure. Okay, uh, how about this here? Let's see. I'm trying to I'll pull up some of the pictures. Uh, is this your then here? Yeah, that's my dad. He has his uh, A2, you know, bomber jacket on there. I don't know whatever happened to that. Uh, oh, okay. He didn't come home with it, uh, but those are two of his helpers. He had many, two of his helpers there. Okay. Yeah, in Belgium, he had many, many people that uh, helped him, and uh, he's the ones he stayed with lengthy periods of time with. He kept in touch with after the war. Uh, we exchanged Christmas cards, and he stayed in contact and until uh, they died. Oh, wow. And, you know, I, I like to kind of reiterate kind of what you said earlier. Like, for example, these two women, for example, I mean, they risked everything. Because if, you know, again, if the Gestapo had found out that they were hiding an American, an American pilot of all things, I mean, they would have, it had been over as well. So, I mean, they, they were heroes as well. So I appreciate their efforts. Hmm. Yeah, Paul Tilcan, the customs officer, a couple of months after he helped my dad, he was arrested by the him? no, uh, -uh. not them. Okay, he was arrested by the Gestapo, uh, sent to prison, tortured, and he narrowly escaped being executed. But his health was broken from the torture that he took, and he died at a you know not too long after the war. Mm -hmm. The 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 gentleman you just showed. Let me put that back up. Yes, uh huh. That's Dr. Paul Delahaye, and uh, I probably wouldn't have written the book if it wasn't for Paul and another Belgium gentleman, Jacques Lalot, who were young boys during the war and greatly affected by it. it they saw firsthand the atrocities committed against their family and friends. Mm -hmm. And later on in life, they interviewed all these Belgian people, members of the Belgium underground, about events that took place involving my dad and his crew, and they documented their testimony. And they gave me unbelievably detailed information about events that would have been lost forever uh, without their dedicated research. So a lot of their uh, research is in the book. And Good. then in 1984, uh, Dr. Delahaye formed the Belgium American Foundation to honor, remember the, the US troops and allied troops that came to their rescue to liberate Belgium from four years of Nazi occupation and Nazi oppression. And they erected a number of memorials uh, in the area, one to my dad and his crew. So uh, my dad and Paul was, were very good friends. And now uh, Paul died in 2013, hmm. but his daughters, Crystal and Savrine, carry on his legacy and uh, I'm dear friends with them. But I was a good friend of Paul too. I, I, I met him uh, on uh, several occasions. That's really good. Now you mentioned memorials just now. That kind of brings me up to my next uh, question, next segment. Uh, there is actually a memorial, uh, the, what we call a Susan Ruth in the B-17 memorial. Uh, I'll bring that up. So uh, right. is that uh, located close to where the crash site is, or where is this at located? Yeah, that's in the little village of Mackinwas uh, at the distillery farm, which is very near where the plane came down. Okay. Um, you know, there's no one in, in the plane while well, the two crewmen that were killed, but they, as, as the plane came down and swirled down, they were kind of thrown out of the plane, but it's near where the, the plane crashed down. And on the front there, you see two uh, plaques that have the names of the crew, their ages at the time and their crew positions on the time. 
uh, that memorial was erected in 1989. And prior to ninth, and prior to 1989, my dad didn't like most World War II veterans didn't talk very much about the war. I just kind of knew the basics. Mm-hmm. But my dad and three other members of the crew that were still living at the time uh, went over for the de- dedication of the memorial. And there my dad was reunited with all these Belgian people that hit him during the war and revisited oh, these homes. A great and reunion. <laughs> and that brought it all back. And then he started talking about it. And then I made my first trip to Belgium in 1994, five years later with my parents. And that's when it became personal for me. So I, because I got to see all these places firsthand going around with my dad and actually were, were able to meet a couple of his helpers. Wow. That, well, that's great. I mean, I'm like, cause some, you know, some people, you know, war is so horrible. They don't like to talk about it, but I'm glad that your dad was able to talk about it, you know, and again, I'm like, I'm a history buff. So I think it's very important that we hear these stories and not just for like for their generation, your generation, my generation, but for generations to come. Uh, cause I mean, that's, it's, it's, it's living history is what I would call it. Oh, a- absolutely. You know, the, the story of my dad and his crew is all based on firsthand testimony by the people who were involved in the, in the events. Uh, well, I retired in 2009, and that's when I had the time to really delve into my dad's war history in more detail. And three years into my research, uh, at, at the beginning, I had no intention of writing a book whatsoever. Glad but you after, did. <laughs> but after three years of research, I just came to the conclusion that the story of him and his crew was so compelling and so unique that it needed to be told. So. I wrote a book. And um, I'm looking forward to reading it myself. I mean, I, I just, I'm in, I'm just intrigued just talking to you and, and hearing who you've interviewed. Uh, let's talk about the B-17, the plane itself that he was uh, flying that day. Uh, is this one here? Yeah. Um, they had, that's uh, part of the 306 bomb group. Uh, you can see the triangle H on the tail there. The 306 bomb group was in the first yes. air division, mm-hmm. which was signified by a triangle. And then every bomb group uh, at the peak, there were 40 bomb groups in the 8th Air Force. But the 306 bomb group uh, designated letter was an H. So the triangle H, of uh, the 306 bomb group. And then that each plane was assigned uh, a specific tail number by the manufacturer, and that's the tail number of my dad's plane, 31499. Uh, uh, the, the Boeing company des- designed the, the B-17 and produced 60% of them, but Lockheed uh, Vega and the Douglas Aircraft Company each produced 18% as well. There were, there were three different models of B-17s thro- flown in Europe. The first was the uh, E model, which they only built about 500 of those, so they were quickly phased out by the F model. And then the F model was phased out in the fall of 1943 by really the definitive uh, B-17 model, the G model, which you can always tell the G model by the chin turret underneath the nose. So that those B-17s that you showed flying are the F models without the uh, chin turrets, but my dad was shot down in a G model. I see. We have a comment uh, from here, more of a comment than a question. I think it's very, very, that's very nice. Uh, Gene Hudson says, you know, you hear of things that happened in school and when family talks about it, but these stories really bring it home. What men sacrificed for all of us to have our freedoms. Amazing. Thank you, Gene. I think that's very nice. Absolutely. They were the greatest generation. And, And flying combat was just brutal. Uh, and extremely dangerous. 26,000 men died in the 8th Air Force, which was more than the entire Marine wow. Corps fighting oh. in the Pacific. And another 28,000 men became prisoners of war after their planes were knocked out of the sky, either by uh, German fighters or German anti aircraft fire. Being a combat crewman in the 8th Air Force was the most dangerous duty assignment in the United States military during World War II. And it was dangerous at the time they. St- they took off to the time they, they landed. Well, on your dad, do you know, um, did he always have, or did he say that he always had aspirations to be a pilot or did he just become interested once he joined the military? Kind of, do you know how that kind of turned about? The only reason he became, uh, went to the air force is to make more money to support his family. <laughs> okay. Hey, that's a good reason right there. <laughs> oh, 
Yeah, you know, it's, uh, yeah. And it was a good decision, you know, the, the uh, That's he great. had, uh, he, he, after the war was over, he didn't fly again, you know, uh, as far as, you know, his own plane, because, uh, mm -hmm. you know, he didn't want to stay in the military, military because he had a wife and two little girls. He wanted to get back to civilian life and, you know, build a, start a life uh, with his family because, sure. you know, when he left, uh, Susan was only one and Nancy wasn't even born yet. So uh, he really didn't know his daughters at all. Uh, so he just wanted to get on, on, on with his life. Well, I'm, I'm, well, I'm certainly glad he did. He, he, he deserved it actually <laughs> yeah. after all he had been through. But, um, uh, you know, at, 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 at the time the World War II started, you know, there weren't that many pilots, you know, mm -hmm. almost all these guys that, that flew, uh, during the war, you know, they were just civilians. And then they went into the air force and learned how to fly a plane, whether in the, in the Europe or in the Pacific. So there was just a, was a very, very small number of uh, guys that knew how to fly a plane before world war II started. Cause you know, commercial flight was, was, was not uh, prominent uh, at all. You know, yeah, air, 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 airlines or, you know, air, air, flight was still in its infancy, you yeah, know, sure. prior to World War II. It was kind of a, a new concept, actually, for sure. Um, let me bring this kind of into context, too, and as far as geography. You know, you said that he was shot down over the Belgium-France French border, which was, you know, they're both occupied, of course. Uh, but now in the history shows that when France was occupied, there was the north, which is the German-occupied France, and then there was the lower section, which was Vichy France. Right. Uh, for our audience, now I know, but for our audience, was it the northern German occupied, or was it Vichy France where he he was? No, it was the the German occupied uh, the part of France to begin with was northwest, and then mm -hmm. Vichy was you know southeast. But eventually, you know, the Germans took all, over all of France. Uh, yeah, in a couple of years, I forget exactly the, the date that they took over uh, Vichy, uh, France as well. But no, it was occupied uh, by the Germans. Let's see. We talked about memorials, too. I, and there's a photo I want to share with my audience. I think I, this is one of my favorites that you sent me is this one here. And you can kind of t tell what uh, what this is right here. Oh, that's the World War II Memorial in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, my dad wanted, uh, that picture was taken in 2004. Uh, my dad uh, wanted to go see it before he died, so I accompanied him uh, to a reunion of the Air Force's Escape and Evasion Society, uh, which was held in Pennsylvania. And then we took a bus down to D.C. to visit the memorial. It was right before its official dedication. This was April of 2004. Uh, the official dedication was in May uh, of that year, but that was the last trip he ever took. Uh, my dad died three years later oh. uh, in 2007. Uh, he wasn't the last crew member to die, but is the oldest at 91. 91 years old. Oh, yeah. Wow. So that that was a that was a great trip. Uh, like I say, the last one uh, he ever took. It was. Uh, yeah, I cherish that memory. I bet he enjoyed that mute, that the little memorial. I'm going to ask you, I've never seen that memorial. As I see it behind you, it says Atlantic. Is it is it different parts? There's another one that says Pacific. I've never seen the memorial myself. Yeah, on the other uh, the other end of it, it, it says the Pacific. So mm -hmm. that one end of it is kind of dedicated to the Atlantic uh, theater, European theater. And then uh, the other side is dedicated to the uh, Pacific theater. And each one of the little walls, you know, I see the ones that land, there's little bitty walls. Does those represent something? Is there something engraved on them or? You know, I should know that, but I <laughs> forget. I it, I don't know if it's the, the 50 states. Could be. Yeah, I didn't um, think about that. Uh, it might be. I should know that, but I, 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 I don't remember. Well, I'm glad your dad got to see that monument. I'm sure that he, he enjoyed that. Yeah, he was uh, he was a great dad. We had a wonderful relationship. Uh, 
was there ever a time that when he was telling these stories, I mean, let, let me ask you this question. Uh, was he pretty much open uh, as far as back as you remember about his war stories or did he have to wait a little while before he kind of, kind of opened up to talk about it more? How, how did, how do you relate that? Well, after the dedication of the Susan Ruth Memorial in 1989, you know, he was very open. Uh, he would, uh, I wish I would have asked him more questions than I did. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Cause I know the facts uh, and you know, what happened, but I, I've, you know, now you, know, you always think about these when it's too late. Uh, I would have wish I had to ask him about, you know, yeah, how he, how he felt and you know what was going through his mind. Yeah, I knew what he did, but I I didn't know how he never really knew how he, he felt about it. Although you know he he was forever grateful for those Belgian people who uh, sure. hit him. Uh, he owed them uh, his life and they would let him sleep in their bed. They'd sleep on the floor. Oh, wow. You know, they would give him, you know, whatever food they had, depending on where he was. Sometimes he'd eat pretty good. Other times he'd just be eating, you know, potatoes or bread made with sawdust. But uh, they would always give him, you know, more, more food. And so he, he, he couldn't uh, thank those Belgian people enough. And he went back, actually, I think uh, three or, or four times to Belgium. I've been to Belgium now six times. Oh, wow. Well, and, you're well traveled now. <laughs> and uh, I can't wait to, like, to, to go back again. Every time I go back to Belgium, I find uh, something new about the shot down story. Um, really? It, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. Uh, like the last time I went back, uh, we found out that my dad's tail gunner, Bill Schlenker, he came down in France and initially he was hidden by this French woman at her, on her little farm. Mm -hmm. And, but then the, uh, he was injured. So the French resistance brought him over the border into uh, Belgium to the Chimay medical clinic. They smug smuggled him in the back door of the clinic actually because it was be controlled by the Germans and the doctor, you know, fixed his, his leg. But, uh, the great great granddaughter <laughs> of great, this great woman granddaughter. <laughs> who hid uh, Schlenker. Uh, she contacted the uh, American Air Museum in England, trying to find Bill Schlenker because her grandmother told her about him, mm -hmm. and then they knew of me, so they put me in contact with uh, with her, and. Uh, on our last trip over in 2019, uh, I met her and Bill Schlenker's grandson. We came over as part of the entourage. And she took us down to that farmhouse in France, which she owns now, this little stone building. Wow. And we went in and, you know, we went down in the basement where she hid uh, Bill. It's still uh, there. Oh, still there, you know, it's, mm. things like that happen every time I go over. Um, I went great. over uh, one time and uh, this friend of mine said, I, I, I know a guy that has pieces of your dad's plane. And I go, you're oh, kidding me. Wow. <laughs> he goes, yeah. Um, after the war, this Belgian man, you know, took a couple pieces of the, of, of, you know, the aluminum, made sure. a roof for his chicken coop. And then this guy who uh, collects mil uh, militaria, uh, at his home, you know, we went over to his place. This, this guy couldn't speak any English, mm -hmm. um, but you should have seen this guy's collection in his home. He could have started his own museum. He had you know, <laughs> all these guns and helmets and, you know, oh, it was amazing. But he had wow. a small little piece of my dad's plane and then two larger pieces. One was nailed to the ceiling of his attic, but he gave me the small piece and then the bigger piece uh, I couldn't bring home, but it, there's a little museum over there in 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 the area that has memorabilia about the war and about the susan ruth so i dedicated it to that so something every time i go over there so I, something new uh surfaces it's, it's incredible keep going back steve keep going back we want to know more <laughs> it's like you know that chimay schoolhouse that uh, the germans were occupied as a barracks basically that they took uh, the airman back to and interrogated him. In one of the schoolrooms, in the classroom, there's German writing on the on the wall. Uh, 
that's still there from from World War II. Uh, it, it's just amazing the history that's that, that's that's still there. I, I, I'm yeah, I'm very very intrigued. Uh, you mentioned the hiding earlier, uh, talking about your dad when he was hiding in Belgium, uh, about some very very brave individuals there. Um, you said they let him let him sleep in their bed, but were there ever times uh, did he ever say that maybe I don't know were German maybe maybe Germans were maybe nearby and they had to either throw him in the basement or hide him in the closet somewhere? I mean, did that ever occur? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, this one time he was at uh, Maurice and Ghislaine's Bayou House in Charleroi, uh, Belgium, which was a little further north than Chimay. Um, But there's pounding on the door one night, and oh, uh, wow. Maurice told my dad to get up on the roof. On uh, the roof. Oh. Yeah, and then uh, he'd come get him when it was safe. Well, he never came. My dad spent the entire night up on the roof because the Germans never left the area. And I've been in that house and in the attic, and there's just this little small window that's in the attic that you have to crawl out of to get up on the roof. Mm -hmm. And the roof has this real steep pitch, and it's made of tile. I can't imagine climbing out of that little tiny hole and getting up on that roof, let alone staying up there all night long, um, because... Wow. Incredible, but that's a you know I've been in all these these rooms, these houses, these farms where my dad stayed. You know, look out the window, look out this little porthole, look up in the roof where he hid. So it's uh, it's absolutely uh, uh, amazing to to be so blessed to, to be able to go back and see all this where everything took place. Everything happened, and not only just see where it happened, Steve, but you're talking to the family members or the future generation of these people. And I think that that's just, that just adds to the story right there. Yeah. Also at, at the, at the Bayou house there, um, the last time we went, uh, we were taking some pictures out front and then the, the second story window opens. And then this man like looks out and says, can I help you? He could speak uh, English pretty well. I said, yeah, my dad was hidden in this house uh, during World War II. He goes, really? So he comes down. And then uh, Maurice Bayou had taken a lot of pictures. And that, that, in fact, there's over 200 time period photographs in the book. So you can visualize everything. Oh, you're wow. reading. I'd okay. love to see that. <laughs> but uh, Maurice had taken a bunch of pictures uh, while my dad was there. And there was a, I showed him pictures of in the in the back of the house where they were sitting around. And so he took us around and showed us that area. <laughs> Looks just like it did, you know, 75 years ago. Nothing changed. <laughs> and then I showed him a, a picture of my dad inside the house. And he looks at it and he goes, that wall covering behind your dad is still there today. So we go inside the house and the wall covering is the same wall covering that was there 75 years ago. So I, I posed like wow. my dad posed against this wall covering. You know, we took a picture, you know, so I, I have one with my dad here in 1944 and one with me there in 2018. <laughs> 75 years later. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. I think that's important. I'm, I'm, you know, it sounds like the Belgian people, for the most part, they, they preserve their history. They really oh. believe in their history. They're unbelievably brave, wonderful people. To this day, they're still so thankful and so grateful for the Americans rescuing them from Nazi occupation. And they do a great job of educating the younger generation to remember really? and realize the importance of it. You know, the, the, in America, we have no concept of what it was like to be occupied by an enemy force for we four don't. years, where every freedom that you had was taken away you know, and you suffered, you know, this brutal occupation, you know, people getting murdered for, you know, for nothing, killed over nothing, thrown in prison for, for nothing. You know, you have, you can't move around freely. Uh, food is scarce. You know, you're, you're going hungry all the time. And a constant uh, state of fear all the time. Constant state of fear. You know, the people in the U.S. just can't, comprehend that you know we've never been invaded you know we've always had our freedoms you know we can do whatever we please 
Um, and that's the sad thing that a lot of people today, especially the younger generations, you know, lack the appreciations for what it took and the sacrifices that were made for us to enjoy the freedom that we have today. But those people in the occupied countries, I mean, they know what it's like to lose your freedom. Sure. So they, you know, try to really impress upon their children the importance of what took place. Absolutely. Well, Steve, uh, it's not all lost because we have people like you uh, that keeps the history alive. And that is very much appreciated, uh, not just you know for your dad's sake and his crew's sake, but for everybody. I think every American needs to uh, appreciate and knows the sacrifices because they weren't easy. And so I'd like to bring up your book again for uh, the people that are watching this, whether you're live or watching on the archives. You, If you love history and you... You have to buy this book. Uh, it's called Shot Down. It's a true story of Howard Snyder and the crew of the B-17, Susan Ruth. Uh, just to kind of reiterate, it was shot down over occupied territory in World War II. And uh, his, it's a story of survival, of bravery. Um, I'm sure, like he said, we haven't covered everything in the show, but I mean, harrowing escapes and uh, really, really a stressful time. But it sounds so interesting. And and he's written it not just from his dad's point of view, but from the crew members and even uh, at the time, an enemy soldier from his point of view. So, uh, Steve, let me ask you this. If somebody you know watching this wants to buy this book, what would you say the best way to do that? How would they order this book from you? Well, most people get the book on Amazon. But if anyone wants a, a signed autographed uh, copy, they can go to my website, Steve Snyder author dot com. S N Y D E R. Okay. And then I'll uh, sign it. You can just pay by any, any credit card and or debit card and I'll, I'll send it to you. And uh, my website is just not about my book, but there's a great deal of history about uh, on there about World War II archival uh, footage of uh, the air war uh, interviews with veterans. There's just a lot of information about uh, World War II and about the air war over Europe. Also, in addition to the story of my dad and his crew and the Belgian people in my book, what, what I added was just a, a great deal of historical information and anecdotes about and surrounding the war to put it in context mm -hmm. and uh, give it background. So there's it's, it's a history really about the entire air war over Europe, what was happening in the world at the time, the 8th Air Force, the B-17, what it was like to fly combat missions. So. In addition to the story, the riveting story of my dad and his crew, it's uh, there's also all this history that I've added to it. Sounds very, very, very intriguing. And ladies and gentlemen, I got the website here below you. It's uh, stevesnyderauthor.com. So check it out for more information. And of course, if you buy it from here, uh, Mr. Snyder here can autograph it for you. So that's 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 well worth it as well. So. Uh, well, uh, Mr. Snyder, I can't uh, tell you how great it's been to have you on this show. Um, you're gonna just in, curious. Do you plan on writing more books? Hint, 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 hint. <laughs> no, I, I don't. I don't think so. I get asked oh, that quite a bit. Our uh, loss. <laughs> really, uh, since I re wrote the book, it's changed my life. I basically have a part-time job now because I go all around the United States signing copies of my book at air shows and I do lots of public speaking making PowerPoint presentations about That's the book good. and so really it's uh, become a new career for me but it's my passion you know it's what I love to do and I you know I just try to keep the memory of these guys alive well I've always heard if you do what you love it's really not a job and so that's it sounds right. like you're, you're you're doing what you love and that's that's actually wonderful uh, again, ladies and gentlemen, uh, go to uh, stevesnyderauthor.com, and uh, the book is called Shot Down. Very intriguing book. I can't wait to get my copy. So, well, Steve, I am very grateful you uh, came tonight. It was great been talking to you more about you and your book and your dad. So uh, I appreciate you sharing your time with us tonight. Well, thanks, Bob. I appreciate you inviting me on your show. It's been a lot of fun uh, uh, and very enjoyable. So. Much appreciated. Okay. Please keep in touch. Will do. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Okay. Take care. And ladies and gentlemen, I think that's all it's going to all the time we have for tonight's episode. Appreciate you joining us. Thank you so much for uh, 
tuning into the Van Buren Variety Show. And if, if you really like it and you want to see more guests and more topics, you got to hit that subscribe button. And then that way you can keep track of upcoming events. And don't forget, you can look back on the archives and see past episodes that we've had. So I, I think you'll be very, very impressed with that as well. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm glad you tuned in and hope you tune in again. We are here each week with an individual guest, a different topic. So I uh, look forward to seeing you once again. This is Bob Van Buren for the Van Buren Variety Show. Have a great evening, everybody. Good night. <laughs>